Welcome to the Art of Change podcast, where we take a look at the latest news and events happening throughout the Arts Division at UC Santa Cruz. I'm your host, Maureen Dixon Harrison, and I'm the Assistant Director of Communications and Marketing here at UC Santa Cruz's Arts Division. Rick Graylinger, Professor of Film and Digital Media at UC Santa Cruz, is a world-renowned archivist, writer, filmmaker, and founder of the Preylinger Archives and the Preylinger Library in San Francisco. He's also been a pioneer in making archives accessible to the public. In this episode, we talked about his work and how it has been influenced by diversity, equity, and inclusion issues. I hope you enjoy this very interesting and engaging conversation. Thanks so much for joining us. How has your work as an archivist informed your leadership practice and your commitment to DEI? I've been a moving image archivist for almost 40 years. And one of the interesting things that's happened in the, in the archival field in the last few years is that archivists have begun to see themselves as social actors. In other words, the work of um, keeping society's memory, the work of recording and preserving culture is actually a social project. It's a political project that isn't separate from um, what is happening out on the streets or out in the world. And so that's really influenced me to think about what I do as um, something that has social implications. And when I started uh, teaching at, at UCSC in 2013, um, very quickly, I realized that in some ways, uh, well, in many ways, that my work here was my political work, working with students, working with the new California, trying to bring uh, people in the present a consciousness of the past so that it could influence the future and so that they could be strong agents in their lives. Uh, and so there's a really organic relation between my archival work I'm interested in history that is actionable. I'm interested in history that doesn't just tell us sort of where we've been and what happened and all the good and bad stories that come out of that. Um, I'm interested in history that we can leverage to help change the world. Uh, I've talked in the past about um, archival interventions, archival work as a practice of intervention where you inject the record of the past into the present so as to influence the future. And that's really influenced me a great deal. Um, archives used to be really sort of ivory towers where history and media went to die. You know, it stayed on the shelf. It wasn't very accessible. Uh, it wasn't necessarily meant to be used. And in recent years, we really don't think that anymore. Uh, and um, archives have become laboratories for um, thinking about different worlds that we might want to live in. And education, especially higher education, is sort of the ultimate laboratory for rehearsing the future. And so when I think of diversity, equity, inclusion, structural change, uh, restructuring the university for the future, um, it's really a consistent uh, project with my archival work. Uh, we have um, an amazing student body. We have an amazing community of staff and instructors and, and professors. Um, let's make it representative. Uh, the state of California pays our salaries. Let's make this university representative of, of not just uh, who we are in California right now, but who we're going to be. Uh, this is a really exciting project. It's given me a lot of energy to imagine this. You know, we all think, what can we do uh, to make the world better? And uh, here we are, I, I come to work or I sign on to Zoom and I have like direct opportunities to make things better. And that's uh, kind of an amazing privilege. Yeah, that sounds really gratifying. And um, I remember you saying something that really struck me about how doing this kind of archival work is kind of a remedy against amnesia um, in our history and, and keeping good track of that. Yeah, um, you know, sort of a, a 
Well, dominant American culture tends to privilege nostalgia over history. Uh, it tends to privilege a kind of fuzzy memory about the good old days uh, against the bad new ones. And that's really not the way it is. Um, it's far more interesting to look at history as a series of uh, differences, a series of struggles, a series of contests um, where people did something where people resisted, where people uh, thought about new ways, people tried to make uh, uh, moves in the direction of justice. They took risks to do that. And that history is all over the place, but it isn't always in the foreground. So for years, uh, the kind of work that I collected, it wasn't Hollywood films, it wasn't TV shows, it wasn't you know news, it was films about, um, uh, workplaces, industrial films, it was educational films, films designed to train students to be, uh, you know, uh, better students, workers to be more productive, people to be more patriotic citizens, and so on. And it turns out that those films are a history of American persuasion. And you can see a lot about the history of North America through its history of persuasion. And then there's a whole parallel uh, uh, trend in films, they're films about struggle, films about resistance, films made uh, by social and political groups, films made uh, as part of, um, you know, efforts to change society and make it more equitable. And when you look at all this together, you really get a neat and a very rich um, and often very nuanced picture of, uh, of what our country and our world was like. And in recent years, um, my archival efforts have been focused heavily on home movies, film that was shot by families, by, uh, you know, maybe really small organizations, but mostly personal material. People shot it to document, you know, uh, their lives, their ceremonies, their rituals, their travels, people, things, places, animals that they loved. And this is history that's so incredibly vivid. It's daily life. It's shot by ordinary people. There's very little that's corporate about it. And um, it's really vivid. It's an inclusive history because uh, with the beginning of eight millimeter movie film in the 1930s, it became affordable for working people, for families of color, for rural people, even for children to shoot home movies. And so we have this incredible record of a, uh, of a diverse society on film. Uh, and showing this, um, showing this uh, footage to people, especially uh, people in, in, in urban uh, and specific communities, gives them a real sense, hey, this is like me. This is like my grandparents. This is like the world my parents grew up with. Um, uh, I see myself. And, uh, and it's great to be able to put that footage back into the foreground again. Yeah, I, I can personally say that I, I love uh, your lost San Francisco of being a native San Franciscan. Um, just again, seeing that history and, and how we need to connect to it is so important. So that's, that's been really valuable for so many people. I, I love those urban history projects. I love when we can get 800, 1,000, 1,400 people in a room and get them talking and answering questions and yelling and correcting me and correcting each other and, uh, and showing uh, you know, a city that isn't just about streets and buildings and freeways and beaches, but it's a city that's animated by people. Uh, that's exciting. Well, tell us about your approach to DEI as chair of the department and um, how you got your faculty involved in the film and digital media department um, in this process. Thinking about DEI and taking some action has been a big priority of my work as chair, especially this last year. Um, I've learned, uh, most of all, I've learned from my colleagues, especially from my uh, colleagues of color and my uh, LGBTQ plus colleagues who have um, uh, a lot of lived experience that uh, is sometimes risky and difficult for them to talk about. But um, they are my mentors, uh, really. Uh, I began last year by interviewing um, uh, all of my colleagues and scheduling these sort of 
hour plus long uh, talks where I agreed not to quote people, but I asked them to talk about their experiences and I asked them to talk about what they thought some of the issues were in our department that we needed to address and uh, how we might get there. And um, that was a big sensitizing process uh, for me, taking advantage of their generosity um, and harvesting kind of what they had to say that helped me think this through. Um, and, uh, you know, I worked with uh, three other faculty members to put together a DEI plan, which incorporates thinking uh, from them. Um, the beginning of thinking from our students, although we still have to do a lot of that work and uh, really a, just a, a compendium of life experiences. And we put together a, a draft plan and that process itself, you know, it really helps you when you begin to categorize and you begin to think about how these issues relate to one another. And also when you realize how important this is, you know, this isn't just about checking off boxes. This is really people's lives. This is, uh, this is, is, is learning from extremely difficult, complicated experiences. Uh, it's hearing about the uh, adaptations that people are forced to make to a structure that is sometimes extremely hostile. Um, also learning about the good things people have done, learning about positive adaptations, good ideas, learning about the culture of our department. Um, uh, so, uh, you know, uh, really one of the great things about the process of pulling together a DEI plan is how much you learn. I mean, uh, you just come out of it differently. Uh, uh, you think about questions of respect, of hospitality, of welcoming, of mentorship, of, uh, Looking for looking for equity uh, where it exists and trying to see where it doesn't exist. That's a real sensitizing process. It's made me think differently about a lot of things. Um, so we have a department right now, uh, which I hope is poised to uh, take this plan. Uh, think of it as a living document uh, and, um, and and move to make some things happen to address all these issues. We have an equity council um, and uh, let's go for it. And tell us about the indigenous media faculty search and how uh, did this emerge as a priority for the department? I think there's a number of different stories going on here. Uh, I think for a long time, there's been a desire to uh, increase indigenous and native representation in our faculty, uh, because it turns out that in the past 20 years, we haven't searched for a person who might have specifically an indigenous studies area. We've recruited indigenous faculty, but not specifically in an indigenous space. Um, I was, everybody had particular influences that led them to support this uh, recruitment. Mine was learning from my students. I had an indig I was teaching a course in uh, in sponsored and industrial film called Made to Persuade, and I showed some films that had been made by the U.S. government and by educational film companies about Native communities. And a student of mine, whose name was Cheyenne Barefoot, recent graduate, uh, who is Chiricahua Apache, took a film that had been made uh, by an, an educational filmmaker called Apache Indians. And she made a new decolonial soundtrack for that film. The images were beautiful. The soundtrack was incorrect and insulting. And uh, she reclaimed that film from the viewpoint of a young urban native person and made this film into a, a valuable object of study. It was immediately uh, adopted by a project called tribesourcing.net and put online. It's a project at the University of Arizona where uh, tribal members revoice old films to decolonize them. And I thought this is incredible. Um, it really sensitized me to a lot of uh, issues um, involving indigeneity and in media. And I began to think that this was um, something we should propose. And so I proposed it as just a title. And then our faculty recruitment committee uh, 
did uh, an amazing job to craft a description uh, of what this position might be. And I worked with them uh, and um, we ran it past the, our indigenous faculty network on campus. Uh, we ran it past the chairman of the Amamutsun tribal band, uh, uh, the, the people who's on whose land we live and work and also by some people in uh, indigenous media with the Sundance Institute, colleagues, and so on. And uh, it was at that point, only after that, that we actually put forth the position description. Uh, and it's a sensitive uh, recruitment, you know, because we really have to be aware of um, where people are coming from, the fact that they represent a tribe, a nation, a community. Uh, they're not just acting on their own behalf um, and uh, we put it out and we got a, a really stellar pool of candidates I must say I think we were all blown away by the uh, the research excellence and the teaching expertise and the artwork uh, represented in these candidates um, so we're very optimistic. This has so far been an exciting process. And it's also been a process that our faculty, uh, I hope has learned a great deal from, you know, this is DEI work in practice. Uh, this is, um, you know, walking the walk and not just talking the talk. Um, it isn't over because if we have a successful recruitment, you know, we're going to have to welcome a new colleague. Uh, and um, this, is, uh, this is not simple but uh, the will is there to do it. What have you accomplished as the Corday family chair in screenwriting for film and television? And how has that gift been transformative for the department? We've been really excited uh, with the possibilities that Mr. Corday's uh, and his family's grant has opened up for us um, concretely. Boy, we've done a lot of things. Um, we've increased our writing classes. Uh, we've uh, supported um, new instruction in writing. I think we've moved from uh, one to four classes already. We've been able to support um, grad students teaching in areas that are um, that have writing at their core. So we've uh, we've offered a lot more opportunities to our students. We've brought in a bunch of guest speakers. Um, for, uh, for um, uh, individual classes, but also for group meetings that are open to everybody. I've brought in um, writers and producers from uh, Colbert, from John Oliver. I've brought in um, emerging novelists who have also become TV writers on the strength of their work. Uh, I've brought in game makers, artists, critics, all people whose work centers writing, uh, who um, uh, are at an inflection point in their career that I hope students will be able to relate to. I've brought in the creator of Mystery Science Theater, mm -hmm. um, Joel Hodgson. I've brought in Jenny O'Dell, uh, author of How to Do Nothing. Many of our students are really, really into Jenny's work. Um, I've brought in some great uh, people writing about issues of race and media and gender and media who are eloquent uh, spokespeople and writers, but um, everything I've, I've done with Corday Funds has been centered around the idea that words matter and that words are vehicles by which you can have agency, you can have influence, you can do your bit to change the world, whether you are writing for the screen, uh, the big screen, or television, or uh, writing in the public sphere, doing critical writing. Um, all of this is something that we needed some help on. And uh, I think we've really opened the door to create students who um, really like uh, Mr. Corday himself are um, adept at different kinds of authorship and different kinds of media, but who know that words are um, tools of power. And what legacy do you hope to leave at UC Santa Cruz? Legacy is kind of hard to talk about. Um, I hope I've helped to, to create an environment where people feel a little more relaxed, where they feel a little safer, 
where they feel a little more open to difference, uh, where they uh, feel that, that we can do our work, but also live our lives in, a, uh, in an exuberant way. Um, and certainly, uh, I hope that uh, we have a continuing focus on archives, memory keeping, thinking about the past and the future. I'm certain that that's true. We have a number of uh, faculty members in our department who are focusing on that. But really, um, uh, I'm hoping that people will uh, feel that I helped make this a good place to study and to work while I was here. I certainly had a great time. I mean, this is an absolute dream job. And I, uh, I, I go into retirement uh, because I want to work harder mm -hmm. and because I want to, uh, you know, uh, push, my, push my research uh, into new directions. And uh, it will probably be a little bit easier to do that when I don't have uh, teaching and administrative responsibilities, but I will miss this place. And I very much hope to, uh, to continue to be involved however I can. Well, we're really going to miss you too, because you've just been an incredible presence here. And you came in with amazing work and you obviously will continue with that. So we'll be able to keep in touch with you and follow your work and attend um, your screenings and, and use your archives. So thank you for all of that. Thank you very much. Um, well. Thank you, and uh, I'm grateful to what everyone has done to make my experience uh, a pleasure. Great. Thank you for viewing the Art of Change video podcast. We look forward to having you join us for future episodes. If you'd like more information about the UC Santa Cruz Arts Division, please visit arts.ucsc.edu. See you next time.